have seen this supplement that came out in today's Gleaner and have had time to read it, and I think you should and you should save it because I think this supplement speaks to what the JIQS has been, is today, and what it will be tomorrow, and the hard work that has been done by the past presidents, some of whom are here with us in the room. I think President Jacobs has summarized it clearly in his message in the supplement, that the JIQS, after 20 years of seeking to be recognized by the government of this country with a legislation and an act for the registration of quantity surveyors as building professionals are almost there. And I think this is so critical to the building industry and the professions that are part of the CIC that all of us who are part of the CIC are governed by legislation and are building professionals under law. As you are aware, there is a building act, and the building act recognizes two categories of persons, building professionals and building practitioners. At this point in time, in the absence of legislation, a quantity surveyor, a chartered quantity surveyor, who is a member of the JIQS or also an RICS, would be considered a building practitioner. I go back to past President Markland Gordon, who was very, very strident and vociferous in his presentation at a seminar hosted by the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development that the Building Act should not move forward and become law unless JIQS members and the profession were recognized by a law. He was told at, by that time, at that time by the legal officer from the ministry that the act can be amended to include the law where it is a law. So we are at that point now where the Building Act is enforceable law as of January the 15th, 2019 in accordance with a directive from Honorable Minister Mackenzie. So when the QS Registration Act becomes law, hopefully in 2020, the act will be amended to recognize that piece of legislation and QSs will be now building professionals under law. We need to educate our potential clients, both in government, private, and public sectors, because it's clear that all this information contained here, which could almost be replicated by each of the members of the CIC, is so critical for the understanding of what we do, what we can do, and the value we bring to any project as Jamaicans familiar with what construction methodologies are here in this country and how we operate as a profession in this country. For investors from Jampro who are sent to Jampro, that we need to really forcibly advise our nation and our publics, the mind the street, about what we do, who we are, and how available we are, that we are not a client-based company or entity that only deals with large projects. No project is too small to have good professional services available to them. Thank you so very much. For the first time in the Caribbean and Latin, Latin American region, we'll be having an international realtors conference. It will be held December 5 to 6 at the Hilton Rose Hall Resort and Spa in St. James. <clears throat> I say International Realtors Conference, but it's not just for realtors. Everyone who has any interest in the real estate industry, it is important that you're at this event. The quantity surveyors will be, be presenting, the values will be presenting, the land surveyors will be presenting. And so it's a good place, one, to network, two, to get some new business. And of, for, of course, the education material that will be shared throughout the two days, unbelievable. The theme of the conference, ladies and gentlemen, we all can relate to it, thinking globally investing locally. I thank you.
The year 2019 marks an exciting milestone for the Jamaican Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and I'm extremely honored to be the president of this noble institution as we celebrate our 60th anniversary. 60 years in time is indeed a significant milestone in the period of history of any organization. And at this time as an institute, we must pause to reflect and celebrate our past achievements and carefully contemplate the next steps in charting the right path towards our future development. Now, since our inception as a professional body, we have been unwavering in the fulfillment of our primary objective, which is to protect the professional status of the quantity surveying profession here in Jamaica. The high professional standards and ethical principles adhered to by our members has undoubtedly resulted in the provision of quality service of the highest level to the general public who rely on our expertise to provide sound financial and contractual advice. Now, as one of the founding members of the Construction Industry Council, we have played a significant role in the advancement of the local construction industry. Through this umbrella group, we have partnered with our allied professions to establish policies, preserve industry standards, and we have been deeply involved in the publishing and periodic review of the various documents which have been made available for use by our stakeholders in the industry. The GIQS has remained committed to preserving and improving our relationship with our international colleague associations, such as the Commonwealth Association of Surveying and Land Economy, that is CASEL, as well as the Royal Institute of, Institution of Chartered Surveyors, the RICS, and we continue to share similar values of maintaining the highest possible standards of professional practice and foster public faith in our work. Education and transfer of knowledge to young prospective quantity surveyors has always been one of the core objectives we endeavor to fulfill. The GIQS was instrumental in establishing the quantity surveying program at the College of Arts, Science and Technology in the 1970s, and we continue to provide support to the Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Technology, Jamaica today. And a number of our, number of our members are dedicated full-time lecturers at UTEC who have remained faithful in training new entrants to the program year after year, and I see a couple of the lecturers here with us today. I would like to emphasize also that as experienced quantity surveyors, we must continue to encourage and mentor as best as we can the younger and less experienced students and probationers amongst us, and most importantly, create a space for them to become future leaders in the years ahead. Continued collaboration with the government of Jamaica is a key objective which we consider critical for the development of the construction industry and the nation at large. One of our most important initiatives this year has been our ongoing drive for registration of quantity surveying practice in Jamaica. The GIQS continues to lobby the government of Jamaica in relation to the quantity surveying registration and to ensure that only suitably qualified persons are eligible to provide quantity surveying services. This year, 2019, the GIQS participated in steering committee meetings spearheaded by the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, during which intensive review of the existing draft quantity surveyors registration bill was conducted. The Ministry continues to work assiduously in advancing this proposed legislation, and we are indeed appreciative of the Ministry's effort in this regard. There is still, however, a lot of work left to be done, and we trust that the push towards this effort continues with the great, great energy and enthusiasm in which it started with. The timely passing of this legislation for quantity surveyors will no doubt lead to the ultimate benefit and protection of the interests of the profession, the construction industry, and the nation. We have also been working in partnership with Similarly, with the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development in the drafting of the regulations of the new Building Act, 
and considerable contribution was made on our part in an effort to assist with the development of these regulations. The GIQS has also demonstrated keen interest in the new Public Procurement Act, which came into effect earlier this year, and we invited the Ministry of Finance and Public Service to engage in discussion regarding this very important piece of legislation. The year 2019 is one also in which we formed new partnerships with the Canadian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, that's the CIQS, and a reciprocity agreement between both organizations has been signed. The Institute also intends, and listen to this carefully, we also intend shortly to finalize the implementation of the GIQS Practicing Circuit Certificate, which will not only confirm that a member is qualified to practice as a quantity surveyor, but will also act as a mechanism to enforce the minimum standards established by the GIQS in relation to CPD engagement and learning. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, on this wonderful occasion of our 60th anniversary, I must recognize the contributions made by our members, both past and present. And similarly, I must also recognize the contributions made by our colleagues and partners whose dedicated efforts over the years have laid a strong foundation for the GIQS. I am indeed delighted to be celebrating this important milestone with you today. And it, was, it is without doubt that our sights are firmly fixed on a bright future. I thank you. When you think about quantity surveyors and the role that they play in the development of a nation, the United Nations, you know, the United Nations agreed that one way to judge the development of a country is by housing starts and the extent to which persons can really afford to build a house and then also by the amount of housing projects that have started and then them have to stop. Then it means, therefore, that if it is that we are to plan the building of our nations, then we have to start with the people, them, who tell we how it can go if we can afford it. So why the world alone is that many of us that are actually Jamaicans, there are not many of us who love the country who have a passion for who we are as a nation and for who they want and who they want us to be. This man, Mr. Mitchell, is one such man. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you today with pleasure a Jamaican. May who welcome Mr. Howard Mitchell. Let me start, get up and say, stop, say no more, say no more. <laughs> retired lawyer and some of my friends would say that's the next best thing to a dead one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's an interesting and challenging opportunity to be invited to speak to your gathering here today. Interesting because previous to your request I like many other Jamaicans knew very little about your profession. To be truthful, I still don't have a full appreciation of what a quantity surveyor was. And I didn't even know that you had a professional association. Forgive my ignorance, which for a person of my age is inexcusable, except in defense to say that if you hide your light under a bushel, you should expect that people would not know about you. So I hope that retaining a big mouth chatterbox such as myself will help to draw the public's attention to your existence. And I publicly congratulate you over and over on your attaining 60 years of existence. And I wish you 10 times that amount in terms of longevity and functionality to come. I know that there are some that frown on the idea of publicity, but hear me out and I will attempt to explain why your institute, why organizations such as yours must promote themselves and must promote what they do and must promote the members of your profession. <coughs> your most efficient and helpful secretary to the institute commenced my efforts at research 
by thoughtfully providing me with not only the profile of your institute and its membership, but also a brief indication of the historical roots of the profession from the early 16th and 17th century. He also let me have a copy of your constitution, about which I'll speak later as I develop my argument as to the urgent and important need for your organization to come out of the closet, so to speak. <laughs> Armed with the information given to me, I have unearthed evidence of the activity of quantity surveyors way back in the early days of mankind's existence here on this planet. It is reasonably argued that the ancient Sumerians and the Egyptians who came after them would have used quantity surveyors in constructing their wondrous palaces and pyramids as there is archaeological proof of measurements of material needed to be brought to construction sites on the banks of the Nile from as far as way, away as its headwaters in Ethiopia, where a particular type of stone was available from that community in exchange for Egyptian corn and salt. The calculations and measurements for both the material and the barter product were in fact quantity surveyed and were absolutely necessary to avoid wastage and inefficiency. It is also reasonably arguable that as proof of the activity of your profession, we look to the biblical reference to the measurements of Noah's Ark. Genesis 6, 14 to 16 provides irrefutable evidence that God was in fact the first quantity surveyor. Because he gave Noah very precise measurements for the ark. 300 cubits long, 5 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. I am led to believe that he also advised Noah on where to get the building material. And I have no doubt that he inspected the work every day. So, you see, your origins, unlike the professions of law and politics, have the direct sanction and approval of the great architect of the universe. <laughs> Having shown that you both have provenance and antiquity, I want to move on to connecting the value of organizations such as yours to the survival and sustainability of civilized society, to the construction and maintenance of the validity and integrity of societal institutions and the very functioning of a civilized community. It is now accepted that every functional civilized society needs three elements to be in balance and for each of those elements not to be too strong or too weak in relation to the other. These elements are generally detailed as the state, the community, and the market. Community is, of course, civil society. The market is the private sector. Each element should be vibrant and effective within the circle of its core functions and should interact with each other in equality and dynamic and transparent contests to satisfy their objectives. Of course, you're going to have arguments, but it must be towards a common goal. That is a very short and crude elaboration of the theory of societal development that has so far assured civilization in successful societies. And I'm being deliberately brief, because I know that everybody here has important things to go and do. So you have to use your imagination to fill in the gaps. If we impose that template of relationships on our beloved Jamaica, let us see what we come up with. And historically, I am going to describe that Jamaica endured three centuries of brutal, all-pervasive physical and mental conditioning that created a culture of self-deprecating, self-disrespectful, crabbing a barrel individualism with violent characteristics and a complete indifference to tendencies that would create a constructive, considerate nuclear family, progressive and unified communities, and a civilized, nationalistic, 
and equal society. Now I know that's a terrible statement, but as quantity surveyors should know, all good outcomes are based on facts. And my description of our history is factual. And I am prepared on some other occasion, if you buy me a drink, to go through the history <laughs> and prove what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so when the monster of colonialism was finished with us, tired of consuming our substance and spirit, it spat us out, supposedly at our request. And we described that as independence an overused word that is as fictional to our reality as the word sovereignty. Ladies and gentlemen, there's more. In fact, after achieving our so-called independence, we promptly built an exact replica of the colonialist state, community subjugated private sector dependent societal system that we are trying to escape from. You know, I'd like to believe that Norman Manley tried his best to build something different. But he was frustrated in his own limited British design prism of vision in attempting to build a society that had elements of our own indigenous cultural experiences and realities. But we have to give him credit for trying. Unfortunately, those that follow didn't have a clue. And so we have constructed the very model of a plantation society with a client patron community relationship with the state, a dependent private sector, which is akin to the merchant class of the past, living off the needs of the plantation supervised by Busher and the overseers, and looking always in vain for rescue from the mother country, instead of forging our own destiny. We have built a society of inequality, and we are an unequal society. We have entrapped almost one third of our population in inner city communities called garrisons. Almost all of our children are entrapped in an inadequate, unequal, dating and dysfunctional education system. So, whereas in 1962, Singapore, with which we then compared favorably, is now exporting computer chips, integrated circuit chips. We are still exporting banana chips. <laughs> <laughs> These are the facts. This is what we have, and this is what we must accept in a world that has no time for small island development, developing states of clusters of fly specks on a globalized map. So we desperately run from one compromised and dependent relationship with one self-serving and hegemonic superpower to another to sustain ourselves in surviving the consequences of our misguided and non-policy driven, externally imposed meanderings through incompetent and tribalist governments who conflate the concept of leadership with the illusion of being a ruler in an unruly society. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that this is unpleasant. I know that it's interfering with your digestion after a lovely lunch. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <coughs> but. I would like to believe that this is what Bob Marley meant when he said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. We have to know about this. We have to accept this in order to move forward. So here we are on the edge of the fifth industrial revolution. <clears throat> in a world where the elephants have begun to fight. And our little ants nest is right in the middle of their stomping ground. What do we do? As the soap opera goes, what do we do? <laughs> do we follow the pattern of our delightfully articulate and hardworking foreign minister who says that she would not be drawn into the debate? Or do we posture in the manner of a bantam fowl, like one of our opposition sen senators, and noisily thump our chest 
and crow defiance at the elephants to appease our unenlightened, still oppressed and deluded tribalist camp followers. I submit that you and your institute should respectfully decline either delusional portion and brew your own tea. We as a nation need to come to grips with some unpleasant truths in order to forge a path to the future. The first truth, our current political system and social framework is the root cause of our systemic failures. It's the root cause of our overwhelming crime and violence, our corruption and our indiscipline. Second truth, we as a community have abdicated our responsibilities as citizens to participate in the building of a nation and made ourselves dependent on a state which has never had a clear idea of a long-term policy-driven development. We have allowed the establishment of garrisons, the subversion and capture of the civil service, the insidious tribalization of societal institutions ranging from the schools to the churches to the professional associations for the maintenance of political power and to allow for the distribution of scarce benefits and spoils. Instead, when we should be building our human resources to achieve sustainable growth, based on our undeniable creative capacity. The third truth, our private sector is a conspirator in the corruption of the financial affairs of the government and the financial support of those who misguidedly seek to monopolize power in themselves personally, rather than articulating, persuading, and establishing long-term policy objectives. We have degraded our state institutions so that they no longer have the capacity to deal with the complex demands of a changing world. And we have not replaced them with community or private sector institutional solutions. So as the state has become more dysfunctional, our responses have been to flee to safer havens rather than to develop appropriate mechanisms for development. We need to understand that the value of institutions, and institutions like yours, is, its, is their ability to develop and sustain standards through the ages and to promulgate and disseminate discipline and rules of civilized behavior that build a functional society. And that is why your institute and its permanence and its standards and its insistence on quality must be promoted and exposed to the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a constant thread that runs from and joins the decadent and destructive forces of indiscipline, corruption, and violence together. It is the nexus of selfish and individualistic tribal political behavior that was admittedly a learned response to our historical environment. And that is why your institute is important. You have rules. You have a constitution that you attempt to live by. You have standards that you attempt to promulgate and impose. I only ask that you stop hiding your light under a bushel. That you seek common cause with other relevant institutes and associations in denouncing the corrupt linkage between the leaders of the tribe and the self-serving enemies of the state that want to perpetuate power rather than to distribute empowerment to our people. That you publicize the value of sustainable and functional institutions which have standards and good attitudes that are positive and which contribute to the self-respect of their members and deliver value to their stakeholders. If we in civil society refuse to come together to demand an end to the things that divide us and hold us back, if we tolerate the absence of laws that would capture corruption, we are divided by those who point fingers at each other and say, you did it first, you started it, you did it more than me. What does that matter? How does that matter? It must stop. 
And that is what we must say. So while we pursue our own individual professional interests and our financial security, we must remember this, that the political directorate are united in one thing, their quest for power. In the words of the eminent professor of law at the University of Kenya, PLO Lumumba, there is an urgent need for political hygiene. Institutions such as yours and other committed Jamaican nationalist associations who wish to save our country must now stand together and demand the cleansing. Now, not later. There is hope. It can be achieved. The political system can be reformed as was our fiscal framework. It will take longer to reform our society, but the next step is to clean up our politics. Your active vocal support of this objective as an institution and as individuals is crucial. And please don't tell me that your institute does not get involved in politics. This is not politics. This is saving a society. If we're ever to become a truly sovereign state after we have settled our debts, we must clean up our act. As quantity surveyors, you must all be aware of the tremendous physical infrastructure, the value of that infrastructure that we have abandoned in the inner city and that we continue to ignore while we spread our housing communities further and further away from the economic energy of our markets and administrative infrastructure. We must make our views known and your voice heard as to the continued neglect of the most valuable waterfront cities, one of the most valuable waterfront cities in the region, and the neglect of its inhabitants. We must regain our self-respect so that we can stand and say to those who come to lecture us on corruption, go and clean the beam in your eye before you consider the moat in ours. We cannot, in good conscience, say that now. Let us therefore stand together and say to ourselves, step outside our, our zone of self-interest and speak out for our country. I want to congratulate your institute on your achievements, and I want to wish you well for the next 60 years. But I hope for more. On behalf of Jamaica, I hope for more. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Did I not tell you that this man is a Jamaican? Did I not say it? Did I not say that his commitment to our country is not just something that him talk about, that is something that him show? The fact that he would have done his research, and then when it was that he got an opportunity to speak to you as a group, his message was not only congratulations, as most would have done, because that's why you're inviting me here, no, sir? but also, can you join me in the fight for my country? And this is how you can do it. That was his plea here today. And for that, as a Jamaican as well, I say thank you. On behalf of the Jamaican Institute of Quantity Surveyors, I wish to extend thanks to you all for your presence here today. 60 years is an awesome feat. Amen? Mm, yes, sir. To our guest speaker, Mr. Howard Mitchell, we thank you for your presentation and assure you that we have made much stride in improving the prominence of our profession. I also agree with you that our profession has God's stamp of approval. Luke 14, 28, verse 30 says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest aptly, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. We thank you, Mr. Mitchell, and I invite you to come and receive this presentation on behalf of the Jamaican Institute of Quantity Survey.
Mr. Christopher Liu of the CIC, we thank you for being an advocate for the rights of the JIQS and our fight to be rightly identified as professionals. We thank you, Mr. Liu. To Mr. Stoppy, we look forward to pulling from your wealth of knowledge and are extremely grateful for that gift, a BQ from 1905. It is a gift I am sure will be treasured by all of us at the JIQS. I wish to thank the organizers of this event, the PR committee, headed by our president, Mr. Javon Jacobs. Put your hands together for him. <laughs> Ms. Mitchell, Michelle Rose, who helped in coordinating, and to the entire council. The success of this event is a testament to our hard work to the hotel and staff for a wonderful meal and a great service. To the musicians, we thank you. Without our sponsors, this event would not be possible, especially our gold sponsor, BH Paints, as well as China Arbor Engineering Company, the NAA, and all our other sponsors, we thank you. To our master of ceremonies, Mrs. Georgia Crawford Williams, put her hands together for a wonderful master of ceremony for taking us through this luncheon and making it such a wonderful event. We thank you all. We thank you for coming. We look forward to another 60 years as we work together of putting the GIQS and the professionals of quantity surveys where they need to be. We thank you. <laughs>